Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. The story of the vague conjectures is one of the most interesting chapters in the history of 20th century mathematics. There were precursors to this conjecture made by Artin before they made his conjectures. What's really interesting about the conjectures, though, is that they actually suggested a way of proving his conjectures. Um, and what it involved was basically trying to come up with a new cohomology theory. And remember, cohomology theory is something that you use to study continuous topological spaces. Okay, so the idea was to try to come up with a cohomology theory, but one which would work for varieties over finite fields. And these are things which are seemingly discrete. As it turned out, this is exactly how uh, the vague conjectures were proved, and it led to two Fields medals, uh, one for croton Dick and one for Delane. Okay, so let's have a look and see what the vague conjectures are about. It's something in algebraic geometry, so basically you want to look at solving polynomial equations. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll fix a field F, and we'll look firstly in an affine case, uh, an affine equation, so we'll look in uh, the affine plane with coordinates x and y, and suppose we're given a simple uh, polynomial equation like this one, x squared minus 2x plus y squared equals 0. Now in this case, the coefficients here are all integers, so you can think of these uh, coefficients as belonging to any field that you like. Okay, You can simply map the integers naturally to any field. Okay, so, so for example, if you want to think of this as the equation over the reals, you can easily draw it. Okay, So to do that, what you do is you take the x squared minus 2x, complete the square by adding 1 to both sides. You get x minus 1 squared plus y squared equals 1. So of course you get this circle here with center x equals 1, y equals 0. Okay, but you can also look at this as an equation over uh, the complex numbers. If you do that and you try to solve for it, what you'll find is not something which is now a, a one-dimensional manifold, but rather a two-dimensional uh, manifold. You can also try to solve this over finite fields. So the vague conjectures uh, mainly are concerned with what are known as projective varieties. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the projective version of this uh, equation here. So let's just remind ourselves what's happening with projective geometry. So here, instead of looking in the affine plane with coordinates x and y, we'll look at the projective plane with homogeneous coordinates x, y, and z. So that means we're looking at triples x, y, and z, okay, uh, where not all of them are zero. And what we'll do is well, I, we'll identify two of them if they are scalar multiples of each other. So x colon y colon z is the same as lambda x colon lambda y colon colon lambda z, where lambda is some scalar. Okay, so basically, we only care about the ratios between them, and hence the notation that you see here. Okay, so to change this affine equation to a projective one, what we need is we need a homogeneous equation where all the terms here are of the same degree. So here you have something that's degree one, so to make it degree two, the same as the others, we're going to have to multiply that by z. The point being that, suppose you're inside the projective plane and uh, you're in the part where z equals uh, is non-zero. In that case you can scale it to be one, okay, so that uh, scales to be one and then you have unique x and y marking that uh, point. So in other words you get a copy of this affine plane. So in that affine plane inside here where z is non-zero you can set z equals one. When you set z equals one you get exactly this equation here. Okay, so this is uh, uh, basically going to give you the solutions here, but maybe you get some extra ones when z equals zero. So they come from what's called compactifying the solutions here in the projective plane. Okay, so all we've done here is homogenize this equation, making sure that all the terms have uh, degree two now uh, by multiplying the one which had degree one, this 2x term here, by z. Okay. And you can look for the solutions inside here, okay? And you can do this again over any field that you like because the coefficients here are still those same integers. Now the first thing to remark is that something very strange happens when the characteristic of the field F here equals 2. When the characteristic equals 2, then this middle term drops out. So you get uh, C, I'll call this, um, uh, when you 
so to speak, plot the solutions, okay? You can think of this as defining some sort of geometric object. So that's the uh, curve here, C. Okay, so I'll let this, uh, C be this. Uh, this is given by the equation 0 equals x squared plus y squared now. And in characteristic 2, that's also the same as x plus y all squared. If you square this, okay, the middle term 2xy is also equal to 0, so you just get x squared plus y squared. So here something rather funny is going on. This equation is no longer irreducible, um, but rather it factors. Uh, in algebraic geometry, the better way to think about this is, is this no longer defines a uh, variety. Okay? It defines a scheme which is no longer reduced, and in particular, it's not uh, smooth. Okay? So an important point to uh, state here and to notice here is that something strange happens when the characteristic here equals 2. And it's something related to the concept of smoothness. Okay, and so we're going to ignore that uh, situation here. Okay, so let's have a look at some notation. So the notation we'll have here is uh, C is basically the um, the geometric object that you'll get. Okay, so whether it's variety or, or if you want to think more generally in terms of schemes, given by this equation, and you can talk about uh, the set of uh, rational points of that uh, variety. So here, if you have a variety like C here, given by equation, and uh, suppose the coefficients you can think of as being inside the field F, then uh, you can try to look at the solutions of that. And the set of these solutions are called the set of F rational points, and it's denoted like this. Okay. So um, what we'll do now, and this is the question, and this is what the Bay conjectures really involves, is uh, suppose you fix a prime p not equal to 2, so you're not in this funny situation here. What you're going to do is you're going to look at the set of all f p to the r, so here's the uh, finite field with p to the r elements. You look at the solutions um, to this equation, okay, which are in f p to the r, and you count the number of solutions, okay? You just look at the cardinality of this set. And the question is to have a look at this. This is one of the objects of study here. And the answer to this is quite easy to do, okay? We're going to use a one-to-one -one correspondence to map this set to something that's easier to count, okay? So what we're going to do here is we're going to look at the set of F rational points of C, and we're going to um, remove one point that we know that's on there, okay? So this point here, so let's have a look. If you have a 0 and 0, of course, that's a point um, uh, in here, okay? And uh, projectively, that corresponds to the point uh, 0, 0, 1. You can have z equals uh, 1 and 0 for x and y. This equation still holds, so you have a point there, okay? So we'll remove 0, 0, 1 from this C, okay? So we have one less point in this set. And I claim that this is in one-to-one -one, uh, bijection with the elements in the underlying field F. Okay, so how does that work? Suppose you have a point P here. Okay, a point P inside here. So we'll pick one, say like this one here. And it's not this one here. Well, what we can do is that you're inside the projective plane. We can just draw a line through those two uh, points. So there's a unique line here. And you can call that L if you like. And what we're going to do is we're just going to take the slope of that line. The slope of that line is y on x, okay? And that will give you an element of this field, at least as long as x is non-zero. So what I want to say is that this is a well-defined map by showing that x doesn't equal zero. So what happens if x equals zero? So you look at this equation. If x equals zero, these first two terms drop out. So that means that y squared equals zero, so y is also equal to zero. So that means that you have 0 and 0 here. So up to scalar, since this is non-zero, you can scale it to be 1. So really, you've got this point here. But we remove this point. We're not looking at this point. OK, so we have this. So if we kept this point in and we try to do this, this is the only point where x equals 0. So basically, you'll have infinite slope. That's the uh, tangent line. OK, so when p goes to this, uh, approaches this point, you get this vertical tangent line there. That's what's happening. Okay, great. So that's uh, going in this direction here. Okay. What about in the other direction? The other direction is quite uh, easy as well. So what happens is that uh, you can now um, get given a slope, 
m. Okay. And what you do is you just draw the line with this slope. Okay. So the line with this slope is y equals mx. Okay. And then what you do is you're going to intersect this line. Okay. With this curve here. And since this is given by a quadratic, so there should be two solutions, okay? One of them is going to be 0, 0, 1, because um, uh, you know that when uh, on this line y equals mx, if you put x equals 0 and y equals 0, okay, it solves this. So this is certainly one point on there, okay? Uh, but there's another point. And what you do is you send m to that other point. And basically, uh, if you want to be more precise about this, what you do, if you want to try to intersect the line and the curve, what are you doing? You're solving simultaneously. So you put this y equals mx. Uh, you put y equals mx here, and you solve for um, uh, x, OK, uh, that way. And then you'll find uh, that's uh, the other point. One of the points will be uh, given by this one here, and the other point Okay, it's going to be given by something else. Okay, so that's how you get the other one. And one of the things that you'll find is that uh, if you try to do this in characteristic two, okay, you will run into problems with this argument. But it's a good exercise to show that, yeah, if you're not in characteristic two, then you can find this other point here. Okay, so that gives us a bijection, not from the whole of this set to uh, this uh, field, but of uh, all of this set minus this one point. So that means the number of elements inside C FPR, in other words, the number of FPR rational points of C is equal to, well, you have this one point here, one, plus uh, all the other points, which is the same as the cardinality of this field FPR, and of course, that's just P to the R. So the answer here is one plus P to the R. Okay, that's great. Uh, so let me also explain from a, a more sophisticated point of view what's really happening. So uh, this trick that I've shown you here, which gives you this projection, it's known as the stereographic projection. And what happens here is really uh, what I've proved is that this equation, okay, that's given here, at least if you're not in characteristic two, uh, shows that this C is actually isomorphic to the projective line. And the projective line consists of the affine line plus a point at infinity. So here we've broken it up as an affine line, okay, which is essentially you can think of as a copy of the field, okay, or at least the, the rational points is going to be the copy of the field um, plus the point at infinity. So you get 1 plus p to the r. Okay, let's do some more uh, counting of rational points um, over finite fields. Okay, uh, so let's pick another variety. Let's look at the whole of the projective plane, p to fpr. So what's the point count? For this okay we're counting uh, points of p2 over fpr so what we can do here is we can similarly just say well okay uh, we'll do a similar trick to what we have here okay we'll break this up okay into two parts so in this case this is basically a compactification of the affine plane and you compactify it by adding or in this case here, uh, you can think of that affine plane as where z is equal to 1, or z is non-zero. And when z equals 0, of course, you'll have just ratios x to y. So that's the projective line. So there's a projective line at infinity. So it's the disjoint union of these two. So in this case, what's the point count here? So you just count the number of points in here. Okay, so that's just uh, given by the set of all tuples inside FPR. So you have um, p to the r squared, or p to the 2r. And then you just add the number of points inside P1, which we said was uh, 1 plus P to the R. Okay, so that's rather nice that you have that. And what's good to note here is that, let's look at this, okay? So of course you'll get uh, functions of R or P to the R. Okay, so I'll think of it in terms of P to the R. And what's the function here? It turns out to be a quadratic in P to the R. Here it turns out to be a linear function of p to the r. And perhaps this isn't too surprising, okay, if you think of this one here, of course, you've got something which is essentially, you think of it as a curve, it's one-dimensional, okay. And here this is something that is uh, two-dimensional, okay. Um, so uh, that's why you get that. But what does it mean? 
really mean one dimensional and two dimensional okay so one way you can think of this is well let's look at this in terms of over the reals or better still over the complexes okay well, over the complexes um, because it's algebraically closed it's easy to get solutions to polynomial equations okay and uh, in this case here over the complexes if you were to look at the uh, um, over the complexes what are the points of c okay what you find is that that's now just a projective uh, line over C, okay, so it's a, the Riemann sphere, it's two-dimensional, and this here, the projective plane, uh, if you look at that over the complexes, okay, that's a four-dimensional real manifold. Okay, so you can talk about dimension, um, but then you'll have to think of it in terms of uh, looking for solutions over the complex numbers, okay. Um, and so what the Vey conjectures uh, says is the following. So suppose you have some equations which are defined over Z. Okay, so they're, they're just integer coefficients. Um, so since they're defined over Z, well, firstly, you have, um, uh, can think of it as giving you varieties um, over both finite fields FP and also over C. Okay, so what you do is you look at those coefficients and you can think of them as being either complex numbers, okay, and then you can solve, okay, or you can think of them as being uh, the images inside finite fields, fp, or more generally fp to the r. Um, and suppose that in these two cases, when you look at these two varieties of c and fp, it's going to be a smooth uh, projective variety that you get. Then the point is that, firstly, if you look at what's happening, uh, looking at the over the finite fields, so you fix that p and you look at the, uh, the number of solutions uh, in fp to the r as r increases as a function of this p to the r, you look at that function, that's strongly related to the topology of when you try to solve over the complex numbers. You look at the, uh, the c rational point of x. Okay, so this is a wonderful um, conjecture, okay, it means that suppose you have a, essentially suppose you have a set of equations and you know you have some hypotheses on those equations okay then the idea of solving them over finite fields okay that really tells you a lot about solving them over the complex numbers and conversely so it relates something which looks rather discrete to something which looks continuous and in this playlist, I want to tell you some of the mathematics which goes into how uh, you prove uh, this wonderful conjecture and also how, uh, what you can do with it. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.